if you've ever heard of a book called The Worst Case Scenario Survival Handbook. It's basically a manual based on interviews with experts in a variety of fields. And it includes certain scenarios, emergency scenarios, and how to respond in them. There are these short little chapters. One is called How to Escape from Quicksand. One is How to Jump from a Building into a Dumpster. That might be helpful at some point. One is How to Tell if a Clown is Murderous. I don't know about that. I don't know how you tell about that. How to Remove Your Own Limb and how to perform a tracheotomy. So there would be all kinds of reasons that you might need to know how to perform an emergency tracheotomy on one of your friends if you ever need to. All that you need is a razor blade or a very sharp knife and a ballpoint pen with the ink removed from it. These are all kind of necessary things for us to know. But in the whole book, what is not included is how to survive in a storm at sea in a boat. And that's the exact worst case scenario that we're going to look at today. And I want us to talk about storms, both this week and next week. And of course, I want to use this metaphorically, because we're going through a storm right now as a country and as a community. Some are experiencing a storm in very intense ways. Others, it's more inconvenience. But nonetheless, we're all facing challenges. And the disciples faced a a challenge, a worst case scenario There in their time with Jesus in Matthew chapter 8, we're going to be looking. So if you have a Bible or if you can pull up the notes on the church app, you can follow along with me. Matthew chapter 8, we're looking at verses 23 through 27. Now Matthew, as the author of the Gospel of Matthew, is using what was said about Messiah from the Old Testament. And he is presenting Jesus as the King of Kings, as God in the flesh. As the one true Son of God. And this is important to remember as we look at this story. We're going to take it piece by piece. I want to set it all up with the setting or with the scene, okay? What is happening here in the first couple of verses as we look at verse 23 and 24 in this storm? Well, we have three primary characters or principal characters in the story. We have the disciples, first of all. Verse 23 says, And when he entered into the boat, his disciples followed him. This was a time of retreat for them. It was evening time. They were weary. They had had a very busy day. They were trying to retreat from the crowd. So the disciples were there with Jesus. We also have the storm. Now look with me at verse 24. It says this, and behold. Now get that. In other words, shocking, surprising. This unexpected, severe thing happened. Behold, there arose a great storm on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. Now the phrase in the original language is megas seismos. means great, of course. And then, of course, quaking. Great quaking. An unusually severe storm was going on. This was on the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee is just a large lake. It's eight miles wide. It's 13 miles from north to south. It's 150 feet deep. These were fishermen that were used to being on that sea a lot. In fact, they had experienced storms. They've seen storms before, but we're getting the indication that they had never experienced a storm like this, which says something to us, right? They were followers of Jesus. We are followers of Jesus. And as followers of Jesus, we are not exempt from storms. They were right there where they were supposed to be. They were doing what they were supposed to do. They were following Christ, and yet they experienced this storm. And here's the third character that we have in the scene, and that is the Savior, Jesus himself. And I love the the next line. Look at the end of verse 24. It says, but he was asleep, but Jesus was asleep. Now, to me, this indicates a couple of things. It indicates Jesus' humanness. He grew weary. Again, they had a very busy day. And even a storm in his weariness and in his sleep could not wake him up. I don't know if you ever sleep through storms. I sleep through storms quite often. I was so worn out as I prepared my house for the Hurricane Ike that I ended up sleeping through most of the storm that that night. I'm a pretty deep sleeper when it comes to that. But here's Jesus in a boat that's being tossed to and fro, and he is sleeping. So it indicates Jesus' human nature, but it also indicates his divine nature. 
Jesus is not surprised by storms. He's not anxious about them. He's the creator of the universe. And so he is there. He is at peace. And he is at rest, even in the storm. The storm is intense. If you look at the, uh, the word in the Greek, it means being sound asleep, peacefully asleep. So you have this amazing contrast that's going on, this contrast between his slumber and yet the rage and the storm and the panic of the crew. So let's look now in verse 25. In verse 25, we're going to see the need of the disciples and the desperation that's going on. It says this, and they came to him and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. The fact that they turned to Jesus is interesting. Now, again, remember, these are experienced fishermen, years of experience, experienced sailors. This was a storm. This was a need. This was a desperate situation beyond them, beyond their skills, beyond their intellect, beyond their experiences. Those things for them were not sufficient. It's not that they were convinced at this point about who Jesus was. It's just that they had nowhere else to turn. So storms do that, don't they? Storms tend to get our attention. This is just one of the redeeming qualities of storms that are beyond our control. They they cause us to question our own adequacy and our own self-sufficiency and look for security outside of ourselves to somewhere or to someone else. So what's being exposed right now in the storm that we're facing? Well, primarily, I think what's being exposed is the object of our trust. And what can be measured by the level of our anxiety is the object of our trust. The more anxious we are, the more worried we are, the less trust we indeed have. So the question is, in whom or in what are we trusting? For the disciples, it was their experience, their skills, their strength, their boat. And they came to understand that it wasn't enough. Those things were not enough. So they turned to Jesus. (laughs) And they woke the Son of God up so that he would pay attention to them and their need. I want to ask you, have you come to understand that there are some matters that are beyond your own strength, beyond your own intellect, beyond your own power. Now, we would mentally ascend to that. We would say, of course. But in a time like this, it's proven to be true. Beyond our strength, our abilities, our intellect, and beyond that of the government, where do you turn? When we run out of human solutions and human answers, we tend to turn to God. That's a good thing. So, they turn to Jesus. And then if we look in verse 26, what we're going to see is we're going to see a miracle taking place. Jesus performs this miracle. Here's what it says. And he said to them, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Now, let's stop there for a second. Because you may be asking, like I did when I first read this passage, Jesus is saying to them, with their lives being on the line, saying to them, why are you fearful? And I say to myself, well, Jesus, you've got to be kidding, right? Maybe that's what they were thinking. You've got to be kidding, Jesus. Look around. We're in the middle of the night. There's a storm like we've never seen before. The boat is getting full of water. Why are we fearful? But then think deeply about this. This is a fair question. It really is. Remember again the context. Remember what happened with them. Even that day. Jesus had taught with authority. He had healed a leper. He had healed a servant. He had healed a woman. He had cast out demons that very day. They had seen miracle after miracle. What was going on is they just didn't need one themselves. And here they need one themselves. I think it's really amazing. It's a point to take here from this passage, how we can see the demonstration of God in others and Listen to testimonies of God working in others' lives and applaud them and cheer them on and say, isn't that wonderful? And then when the circumstances or the needs become ours, we forget that power altogether as if it's not meant for us also. But now their need was presented to the Savior. And he says, why do you have little faith? 
And then, here's what verse 26 goes on to say. Then he rose and he rebuked. Look at this strong language. He rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. There's emphatic language all throughout. There's these uh, emphatic words that are used to demonstrate kind of the categories of the intensity in these moments. There was a great calm, the Bible says. Not just a calm, but a great calm, a total calm. The Bible says that Jesus rebuked the storm. Mark chapter 4 records the same story. And Mark adds a little bit more to the story. He says that Jesus stood up and said, silence to the storm. Or as one commentator translated, hush to the storm. And instantly the waves stopped, the wind stopped. And it was still like glass What an amazing display of power. And I want to remind you, okay, in case we we want to extrapolate this to any and all storms and any and all circumstances, we need to remind ourselves that this is how Jesus responds in this storm. He calms this storm. It's not the way that he responds in every storm. Or every challenge, every adversity, we read in the Bible about Paul's thorn in the flesh. We read about Job's sufferings. We read about the book of Acts and the persecution that happened with those who were spreading the gospel. So this story is not intended to teach about every storm that occurs. But there is a profound purpose in the miracles that Jesus performs and in the miracle that he performed here. And it's found, the miracle is found in the reaction and the response of the disciples. Look in verse 27. It says this, The men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? You know what they were saying? They were saying, We don't have any categories for him. He is beyond the scope of our understanding. And I want to say, that's it. Bingo. That's exactly where Christ was trying to take them because that was the beginning of their true understanding of Jesus that they had not had up to this point. Really, part of the outcome of storms, and this was true for the disciples, it's true for us, is that they create disequilibrium. They, they create a questioning about the adequacy of our skills to ultimately see that God just might be who he says he is. The God of the universe, the God of all power. So that which makes us weak also makes us dependent. And it causes us to turn to him. And when God works a miracle, as he did here, it's not primarily, please hear me, please get this. This is graduate level kind of Christianity. Please get it. It's not primarily to rescue us, although that's important. It's not primarily to make us comfortable again. It's not primarily to give us relief. Yes, he loves us. But the miracles of God are not primarily about us. His miracles take place to tell us that he is who he says he is. And that was true of every miracle that Jesus performed in the New Testament. It was to reveal his divine nature and the fact that he had authority and power. And he has adequacy for every need in life. That we can trust him in this life and on into the next. That we have a Savior. And we have a God in heaven. That our salvation is secure. It's beyond us. Our eternity is certain. He's not here to be our spare tire, to be used in only an emergency when we're in a crisis or have a need. Our response to the miracle of God is not, okay, I made it. It is to ask. It is to state. It is to say, what kind of God is he? And To marvel. At his power. But beyond that, to love him, to worship him, and to walk with this God of the universe as a friend, to realize, God, in my most desperate moment, I can be at peace. This was true for the disciples. There was this process that they were walking through, this unveiling this progression of their understanding of Jesus. And this is early on the ministry of Jesus 
But they did finally learn some of these lesson, lessons because God wants to take them as he wants to take us from questioning who he is to marveling his power to worshiping him as the son of God. In fact, the second time that the disciples were in a boat and had a storm, it's recorded in Matthew chapter 14. And guess what? Jesus calmed that storm. And their response was different this time. It says about them in Matthew chapter 14 that they who were in the boat worshipped him saying truly you are the son of God and so these miracles convinced them of what they needed to know and Jesus is who he says he is so here's here's what I want to say as we conclude today here's what I want to say storm has come storm has come quickly unexpectedly Suddenly, and for many, with great consequence. For most of us, it's just a lot of inconvenience. But for others, it's much more serious. I want to say that in that storm, in this storm, we possess three things. And this has been true for all believers throughout the centuries, that in every storm throughout human history, believers have always had these three things. First of all, they've had each other, and we have each other. In the storm, we have other believers. Now, we may not physically be present with one another, but you know this to be true, that beyond our material and physical presence with one another, there is a metaphysical, spiritual body of Christ, and we can gain strength from the prayer, from the support of other believers who are a part of the same family, even around the world. We are never, ever truly alone as believers in Christ. We have other believers who are with us in the storm We have Jesus. Notice, they were in the storm, but they were with each other, and Jesus is with them. He's in the boat with them. He's in the boat with us. He's in the storm with us. And here's the other thing that we possess. In every storm, in this storm, listen, we have the potential for victory. We have that. We possess it. God may not be calming the storm as we would want. Okay, then he calms the storm in our hearts, the storm that is raging in our hearts. And that storm comes in the form of finding or the resolve of the storm, the peace from the storm comes from finding perspective and strength and inner power. Or maybe we grieve, but we grieve with hope. That's the victory of ours through Christ. And even one more thing. Because if you look at this chapter and you look at the succeeding verses and chapters, even in verse 28, Jesus and the disciples get through this storm, but immediately, as soon as they get to the other side of the sea, immediately they're met with a demon-possessed man. And with the disciples there, Jesus cast out the demons and restored these men. After that, in chapter 9, Very first thing again, after that, Jesus is met by someone who is paralyzed. He heals that paralyzed person. Ministry went on, and that speaks to me. It tells me about what is the ultimate triumph over storms. You you see, our ultimate triumph over storms is not merely surviving them, but instead by being used by God for others in them and after them. In fact, if you really want to have victory... If you really want to spike the ball in the face of the enemy, you move beyond being rescued by God to being used by God in the midst of your hardships and challenges. It's the ultimate turn of events. That which meant you harm is being used for good. And that's an amazing, amazing victory. Heard so many stories of these kinds of victories taking place. So many of you are reaching beyond your own needs and helping others. We've heard stories from our community groups that have been meeting. And I tell you, there's spiritual life that is going on in a real strong and powerful way. And here's the unique thing. That kind of spiritual life, do you get this? Sometimes the only way that we can experience unique forms of spiritual life is through storms and hardships. 
had we not had this, would we have the level of trust, the level of perspective, the level of peace? Would we have actual opportunity to use this for good? This is how there is victory over defeat through the power of Christ. And I hope this is true for you as well. What is the object of your trust? In whom are you trusting? In what are you trusting? It's got to move beyond the government. We can turn to Christ because of two things that are true that we learn from this story. Two things that are true about Jesus. First of all, he cares. He responded to the need. He cares. And the second thing that's true about him is he can can. He cares and he can. And if we can be convicted about those two things, we can weather any storm and not only survive it, but be victors, victors in a way that helps us to transcend it and use it to God's glory in some way. Let's bow in prayer. So, Father, thank you for this profound story a real story. We look at stories like this and we tend to think that they are legend or folklore. These are real men being terribly frightened at the loss of their lives and turning to Christ and learning even after that how they can turn to Christ to be adequate for every need that they face. And the same is true for you and me people as we understand that the God in heaven is the God who cares and who can. So Father, I pray that you would convict us of this truth. and We would walk in it, not just merely profess it, but we would practice it and walk in it that indeed Jesus would make a difference in our hearts and that we could, we could set this on its ear from the standpoint of using the storms that we're experiencing, God, beyond survival, for good and for your glory. Thank you for everyone who has come to tune in and watch with us and participate with us. Pray that you bless them, meet every one of their needs, Father. Thank you for this time of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're going to move into uh, a moment here in just, just a minute where we're going to allow you to participate in communion. So this is the opportunity for you to get ready for that. And then we're going to celebrate as a church together the body and blood of Jesus. So now is the time that we ask you to be prepared to partake of communion. I want to remind you of what the bread and the cup symbolizes. Of course, the cross is a thing of beauty to us as believers. It symbolizes the broken body of Jesus, the bread does, the broken bread, the broken body of Christ. And then, of course, the cup is the shed blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. I mentioned in the sermon how, though we may not be physically present with one another, that we are still the body of Christ. Remember, a building doesn't make the church body. And so I want you to think about that for a moment, communion. We commune with God, but we are now communing with each other. It's the amazing thing about the body of Christ that we can cross the boundaries of time and space and spiritually be together in unity. What a special, special time this is. So I'm going to ask you to bow in prayer with me right now, wherever you are. Just bow your head, close your eyes. And I want to give you a moment to reflect, a moment to think about the beautiful gift of Jesus as your Savior, what he did on the cross when he died for your sins, how he came into your life and saved you and set purpose in your heart, and all the many blessings of the spiritual life that we have in Jesus. Just think about those for a moment. Think about the shed blood and the broken body of Christ and allow him to speak to you before we partake in these elements.
with your head still bowed. The Apostle Paul strongly encouraged us to examine our hearts before we partake of the communion, the Lord's Supper. And I want to ask you to do exactly that. This would be a great time for you to confess any known sin. To just admit to the Father in heaven what might be true about you and your actions, your attitudes, any sin that you might have, just to have a time of confession. So now, Father, across time and space, we come together as your church body. We are the body of Christ. And we celebrate the body of Christ right now. We celebrate the broken body, the shed blood of Jesus. And all the love that you have bestowed upon us through the giving of your Son. Bless this time, Father. We seek to honor you here in this communion. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So it was on that night that Jesus took the bread and after he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And the Bible says that after that, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant. This cup is the shedding of my blood for the forgiveness of sins. And as often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray once more. So, Father, we seal in our hearts our love for you by what we have just done. We remember the Lord's death and we proclaim the Lord's death to the world. Thank you. Words cannot express our gratitude for the gift of your Son. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to move into our time as we normally do when we're all together in worship. We're going to move into a time to close our service where you can reflect and respond and worship and pray. Now would be a great opportunity for you to comment um, about your involvement in the service. Any prayer requests that you have, you can click the prayer link. You can click the online give link. You can support the ministry that we have. There's so many needs. Many people in the community are coming to us as a church looking for help in this time of need. So you helping us allows us to, to bless them. And you can click the give link there in the comments section. So let's just continue to worship and respond as God leads us.